All right, guys, we are live. This is the Difference Makers podcast, and with us today we have David Sue. This is Training Day Media, the the man behind Training Day Media. It's not a whole team; it's it's one guy, and this is the guy. <laughs> so it's welcome. Just it's actually just Training Day. Everyone says media because of the Instagram name. Oh, <laughs> okay, I messed it up, and I've been. No, I always you, say this. It's okay. I never really correct anyone. I'm just correcting you because you're my you're my friend. Oh, well, now I feel bad. I got not. I'm <laughs> deleting my notes right now. Now it's just training day. Boom. Good. All right, it's we all got good. David. I David here. To everything. Well, it's good to know that. I. I. You're right because the Instagram handle. Hold on. The Instagram handle. Right there. Yep. It does say training day media, so that always throws me off. But yeah, training day. I have twelve of your shirts, and they do not say media <laughs> on them anywhere. <laughs> Yeah, it would, it would look weird if it said media on there. It'd be like, oh, this guy's self-declaring himself media, whatever he's uh, attending. <laughs> the event media all the time. Yeah. No, but that's that's a good thing. This is a question for you. you you've you changed the game a little bit with with everything. You, you know, I'm your brand is training day. You have more than just your your media content. You have your, your apparel as well that... I think it's some of the most wearable apparel that's kind of in the game right now. Your your hoodies were legendary. Oh, the t-shirts. Okay. <laughs> and and your 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 apparel is super wearable. So you've kind of bridged the gap of, you know, a, a clothing and design company, I I'll say that, and the media side of things. How did you get started with everything and how did you decide that's the direction you wanted to to go with it um i don't know i feel like that's kind of a loaded question i mean i got started because i uh worked out even though it doesn't look like i work out but i mean i just did like the traditional like good loves good lifestyle um bodybuilding type of like global gym stuff um i i think this is a common story where someone saw crossfit in some type of form at the global gym they tried it out and they got hooked and um, that's pretty much the same thing for me. And um, when I started getting a little bit more interested in it, like everyone does when they first get exposed to CrossFit, um, they explored uh, getting into a box. So I did get into a local box, which was um, CrossFit Select, which is a box that was that was here in Toronto, in the Toronto area. Um, and uh, once I started doing that, uh, they, they asked me if I wanted to um, trade a membership for class photos, which I gladly did. Um, so I think based upon that exposure, I just kind of just started practicing. My photography background is basically like nil. Like I don't know anything about photography when I started. I didn't do photography in high school. Didn't care about photography, to be honest. I just wanted to shoot cool photos from my iPhone. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I did know a lot of local photographers that were in the street, street photography game here in Toronto. And I think that was around the time, uh, where Instagram was kind of just starting out and um i think i i think they just opened up the api to allow you to upload photos from your camera roll before they used to force everyone to just you know shoot a photo directly from your camera phone and then that that was the only way you could post it on instagram so that opened up a huge uh window for creativity and all these like local street photographers here like j scale um vision ellie like those were kind of like the household names that were killing the game and those are people that were there were that were people that I knew and just like looked up to and I love their style and I just applied that style to CrossFit in the classes that I was shooting at the local gym and I think that's how that's probably the the easiest way to explain in a nutshell how I started or even just entered this space like it wasn't like hey I want to be this person in CrossFit it was just kind of like I wanted to shoot based upon my style and my interest and then just apply it to that medium. That's all. Yeah. Cause you have a very unique style and you've had one of the cleanest Instagrams since before I even met you, I went back to, I think it's your personal page Yeah, and you have the cleanest Instagram page from like 2000, what, like 17, 16. Yeah. I think it was just because I was just very, very anal about things like that. I, <laughs> I treated like Instagram, like a portfolio or a representation of yeah. your work. Um, nowadays it's completely different, which we'll probably talk about later. But, um, 
but yeah, I thought it would just be like a, a, a pseudo portfolio that was digital. So I thought like, might as well put my best foot forward and make sure it's not like nothing against people that put food pics and stuff like that. But I mean, like, I just want it to be super clean and represent an aesthetic that I want to promote. Right. Yeah. Cause at the time that was not the aesthetic that people were, were, were doing on Instagram. <laughs> people weren't putting that like effort into it. You know, there wasn't the professional look, there wasn't a cohesive look. Mine from then is just like a jumbled mess of whatever. <laughs> like, I don't know what, what was going on. Right. But, there's so much more thought and energy put into it now, but you were doing that back before everybody else back in the day. And you, you know, you can see there's a different influence to your work. And I think that that street side of things is really what separated you from what was kind of happening in the space at the time. And, and even still kind of is happening. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was kind of like a, I don't think I was the only one doing it. I'm pretty sure in the streetwear game and um, street style photography, landscape photography for sure, like that was like everywhere. I mean, that was what was dominating my feed. So that's something that I was heavily influenced with, like in combination yeah. with my own personal interests of like other silly type of things like cars and motorcycles and music and hip hop and sneakers, like just things, you know, I waste my money on, but uh, <laughs> that was, those are my interests. And then I somehow just, I guess the way I shot and, the colors that I chose to like emphasize on my photos for CrossFit just somehow got superimposed on there subconsciously. Right. Yeah. Cause you, I mean, people don't know this about you, but you're a big car guy. Yeah. I'm, I'm a huge car guy and that's, um, I have a huge background in that type of frivolous hobby. Um, <laughs> but I actually right before COVID, um, so I had an events company called fitted in, uh, it was a, a, a local car show for modified vehicles. And um, I sold that brand right before, like literally a day before the pandemic was declared globally. Oof. Yeah. So Good timing. <laughs> um, yeah, it was really, it was a really big, uh, <laughs> big thing for me. But um, yeah, that was, I'm still not out of the car game. Like I enjoy cars on a personal note. But yeah. I'm not involved in type of any type of professional aspect or, or, or events anymore. Do you have any interest in going out and shooting more cars or more, more like automotive photography? Um, yeah, I just haven't done that just because of time. I do sometimes like probably like once a year, hang out with some uh, car friends from way back in the day and, and we'll just like do what's called rolling shots, which is traveling on the highway at, at a unsafe speed, hanging out of the car and, <laughs> and, and doing a slow shutter speed of our own cars and stuff like that. And, and then other people have done that for me. Um, but yeah, haven't really engaged in that too much lately. Okay. Okay. Uh, what, are, what do you find some of the biggest challenges are balancing kind of some of the hobbies and interests like automotive and doing training day and doing the sports side of things? Like, do you find that it's, it gets a little heavy on the training day side and not as much on the personal side? Um, what do you, well, what are you feeling? Well, I mean, the automotive side is all, all done said and done so um i don't really do anything in terms of the automotive space so unless it's for my own personal uh pleasure or hobby um i actually so a lot of people don't realize this but i don't actually do training day full time it was it just started out as, as a fun thing and then it just kind of grew to whatever you want to call this um but i actually have a full-time job i work for the um canadian government um doing it work so that's my nine to five um so i think the 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 answer to your question is how can I find that balance between my full-time job doing training day whenever I can and sleep and then also <laughs> training, right. Which is taking yeah. a huge downturn. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think those are the, those are the four or five things that I try to manage. And I think I'm just floating at this point. Like <laughs> I don't, I don't have a plan. Like it's just kind of like, Oh, let's figure this out or, okay, I guess I'm doing this and I guess I'm not sleeping or, like even before the games of this year, I did a video project for um, MLS and sponsors, and I was literally editing from terminal to terminal, wherever I had Wi-Fi or the opportunity, all the way until I arrived in Madison, and I was like editing all the way till 7 p.m. till like final delivery, and that was that was my fault. But basically, like I think sometimes I bite more off than I can chew. Yeah, I, I saw you in the airport in Madison, just sitting there editing. I didn't even know you were there. You were just like <laughs> in a stall and, hiding. And Castro was right around the corner. Yeah, Dave Castro was right there too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
No, nah, you, I mean, I've, I know a lot of people and I, I don't know a lot of people that work as much as you do or as hard as you do. You're just always going. Yeah. I don't know. I think I need to set boundaries in terms of like, um, the level of effort that I put in. I think I'm, uh, I think I just can't get let go. Sometimes I feel like I'm just a little too anal in terms of like, I got, it has to be perfect. It has to be this. And yeah. And then even if I churn out like version one, I'll just go back like 10 minutes later and just redo the whole thing. And I'm just like, what are you, what are you doing? No one else is going to do that. Like just yeah. leave it as is. And I don't know. I think that's a personal weakness that I got to work on. Do you find that you're making those little changes to the photo or, or video or images or whatever that you would notice, but nobody else would notice? Hundred percent, nobody notices, but I notice, and that makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm the same way. You do like one little thing. You're like, yeah, that that little piece right there. Yeah. That just. Yeah. But I think that's that's the difference maker. That's the separator right there of yeah. like how you you know you've your style is very specific and it's very defined, and it's it's uniquely you. Yeah. And I hope people go and look at some of your work and just go back through the years and see how it's changed. But you, you know, a lot of people have started using your style or things that you did, and you keep changing and, and updating things to make it use, you know, and make you separate from the pack. Back in the day, it was the the two to three swipe. Oh, on Instagram, yeah. the two to three like image swipes, and then you were the one. You, I mean, in this that I know that the first one that did the burst shots and turned them into like a little gift style. Mm. Where did you get some of that stuff from? Does that come from the street culture? Does that come from 100, 100 percent? Yeah, it's yeah, like I haven't invented anything, and I don't want anything to think, like, oh, that's a thing that training day did. Like, I might have been probably one of the first people to do it in that space. Yeah. But I'm I'm definitely not gonna go on YouTube and create a tutorial. I do want to create a tutorial, but I'm not gonna say like, hey, I invented this, right? Um, no. There's, if you're familiar with the Toronto creative space, like there are a lot of huge creators like Chris Howe and uh, Peter McKinnon's yeah. the biggest one, right? So, and yeah. these people actually, if you watch their channel, they did like tutorials on some of the stuff that's being done in this space like years ago, you know? Yeah. You know, like even. Um, you know, putting little effects on the videos and whatever, like that's, that's not like new stuff. Like it's just, it's new to the space because the audience hasn't been exposed to it because they probably didn't have any interest in the origin of where it came from, but it actually came from a whole different area. It's just reappropriated into this uh, CrossFit space or even the sport creative space. Right. Um, yeah. But I'm definitely not like the creator of any of this stuff. I might reimagine it to my liking. Um, but I mean, yeah, like all that stuff is fun and I change it up just because I do get a little bit um, bored with what I what I did like maybe a couple of years ago. So I'll just try to change it up. And and uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a that's another struggle too. trying to constantly keep on top with like different things to keep people interested. Now, this is the big one is, you know, with social media today, how do you stay on top of the algorithm and the growth of, of the algorithm oh, and the changes that it that these guys, you know, you're primarily an Instagram presence. You do some YouTube and, and some TikTok as well, a little bit. Yeah. But primarily on Instagram, how do you keep up with the the algorithm? So back in the days, it was a little bit easier just because, um, and I don't know what the algorithm is just because no one really knows what the secret sauce is. But in I want to say back in the Kim Kardashian days, like what happened was that if you were like a popular celebrity or some type of like trending type of thing, then they would push your content to the popular feed, um, popular page or explore page. Um, up until the last couple of weeks, it has been a little bit of a challenge to get any traction in terms of your content, whether it's like meaningful or good quality or not, just because Instagram has publicly um, stated that they're now uh, devaluing photos so they are now yeah. prioritizing videos um more kind of like instagram reels so the focus and attention has been on like instagram reels which which i'm happy to create and i love doing those too as well but i don't exactly make those in the same fashion as what instagram is trying to prioritize in a nutshell they're trying to be like tiktok um yeah. 
and TikTok is actually something I just really do not get. And maybe it's a generational <laughs> thing. Um, I understand like, you know, if you want to go on there um, and do your thing and nothing against TikTokers and stuff like that. But I feel like TikTok is more kind of like this clickbaity type of like brainless area to consume content. Whereas Instagram is more kind of like, um, you know, like a portfolio or kind of like a representation of your of your best work, you know what I mean? Um, they're, but they're two different mediums and with two different purposes. And Instagram is quickly noticing that TikTok is gaining a lot of like, I guess, audience share. So now they're trying to like steal some of that audience share from, from TikTok by prioritizing things like Instagram Reels, right? Um, so what does that mean for, I don't know, people like me? It's just that we got to pivot and stuff. And now, I don't know, reimagine our content into that type of form form and medium because of the fact yeah. that that's what Instagram is is pushing now, right? For that kind of content, do you find that you'll kind of force yourself to shoot more vertical content and less horizontal or are you, you know, are you cropping more content to, to um, try to get yourself in that position? I mean, whenever I shoot for like social, like a like an app and stuff like that, I always shoot vertical. Um, I did start off shooting horizontal and then cropping, but then finding that it's actually pretty difficult to frame and and to edit the way I want. So now I specifically shoot vertical and um, shameless plug, I did a little YouTube video about that in terms of like how to, how to frame and shoot for Instagram. But basically, yeah, like I think, I think what I've done to change and pivot to this new algorithm is just like think about like, what kind of things would people want to see if I were to shoot that type of content in yeah. a real format, right? Instagram reels format. Um, I don't necessarily shoot for TikTok just because I just really don't understand TikTok. Like, you know, <laughs> like I, I feel like it's, I feel like it's just like constant memes or, or I don't know. I probably shouldn't even talk about TikTok just because I don't understand it, but, but I'm, I'm trying to understand it. Maybe someone can, I, I, I kind of feel TikTok. you there. Yeah. Like there's a meme that's going around and then everybody subs in like this face yeah. instead of the original face. But then that's all TikTok ends up being except for video form of that. The same song, the same dance, the same like emote. Yeah. And like, I think the easiest way to explain it is that you'll probably Google something or someone or look them up on Instagram. The last thing you're gonna do is like look them up on TikTok. Why are you gonna you're gonna look them up to see them act like a fool? Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, like if you want someone in terms of their serious side or what they represent or what they bring to the table, you're probably gonna Google them or even possibly Facebook. And people still use Facebook and then or Instagram to see what work they've done, right? Yeah. But the tick but TikTok is probably the last thing, unless you're in some type of I don't know comedy thing or I don't know. Like I don't want to I don't want to put down TikTok. Like TikTok is it's I'm pretty sure it's powerful and it's great and stuff. And I just, I'm just struggling to find my, my place in there, I guess. Yeah. I, I know what you mean when you say that. So with your growth, how do you find that you're, you're able to maintain growth these days? Like, you know, are you um, trying to do more reels and things like that to, to grow? Or are you, where, where yeah, are you at with that? I mean, lately I've been doing a little bit more uh, real work. Um, so stuff that would be video content that I would post on a normal Instagram post. Um, I have decided to put that in an Instagram, Instagram real format, just because Instagram mm -hmm. is prioritizing that type of content first. It's, it's pretty much an experiment. I don't have like, you know, the secret formula of whether or not it's going to work. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. I mean, it's safe to say like, you know, a certain type of content does get a little bit more traction and, um, a little bit more clickbaity, but, um, but how do you find a fine line between like putting stuff that, you know, people are going to like just swallow up versus not sacrificing your creative integrity. Right. And that's probably something that I struggle with because I'm just kind of like, well, I could do this, but then that doesn't really represent like my brand. Right. It might get the initial like views or interaction or engagement, but I don't, I don't think I would be comfortable like doing that, you know? Yeah. Do you feel like, with the some of the projects that you've been working on that or shooting at the games and working for for certain companies do you feel like it gives you more opportunity to be creative and 
go outside of the box or do you feel like you have to stay kind of inside of your training day box a little bit more from what content you've previously put out? I think um, I've been fortunate enough for 99% of my clients that they have given me complete creative control. Um, when I have a uh, initial discussion with any brand or, or athlete that I've never worked with, I always say like, hey, this is, this is what I bring to the table and this is what I can do. And if you want something else other than that, then I'm probably not like your guy. Um, mainly because some of the things they, they propose, like I just don't know how to do that and I just can't relate to that. Um, but if you, if you need someone like to just simply document something or take photos, like as a, as a photographer, like, I, I don't think I can offer much in terms of contrib contributing to that. Um, if you want a certain style and look and, and angle in terms of how that story is being told, then I mm -hmm. think I can help you in that regards. So, um, nine, like I said, 99% of the people that I've interacted with are totally on board with that. Um, there's been probably like maybe 1% of, of clients or, or events, um, that just don't care about those things. And that's fine too. If you just want me to be like a camera clicker or someone to press a button, like I'm happy to do that too, to a certain extent. And I've done that before. Um, but I mean, those aren't, those probably aren't like going to be my proudest moments where I'm going to be so happy about sharing those type of things yeah. and stuff like that at that point it just becomes a job um but i think i'm being fortunate where you know up up until lately like the brands i've been working with they've just been they've been great they just they just want to know when it's going to be done and and that's it and they never come back and say well can you do this instead like which thank god knock on wood like it hasn't happened before so I'm, i think i'm fortunate in that regards yeah are brands that you work with comfortable with you sharing the content you shot with them or for them, or do they want to have that exclusively on their channels? Um, so I always ask them, but I always, I always presume that you are uh, hiring me to create that content so you can leverage it on your own platform or for your sponsored personalities and athletes. So I usually let them post first. And um, if they post first, then I'll share it or I will post it as a brand new post on my own accounts. Um, but if there's ever a chance like where like, you know, maybe a year has gone by and some of that content has actually not been used, I'll just shoot them a message saying, hey, are you comfortable with me posting that on my, my grid or whatever? And 100% of the time, they're usually okay with it. Yeah. Um, there's been like a, I mean, like, there's been events that that don't like that, which is fine because I'm shooting for them and it's the content that they that they want to use and post because they technically have been hired. I've been hired to, to shoot that for them, um, but but I think majority of the time it should be it's okay. But I always presume like yeah, if they they post first and then then me after. Yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, Justin checking in here. Don't forget like and subscribe down below for more content coming soon from Wadproof and the Difference Makers diversifying outside of the CrossFit space and outside of the training space, like what's been your experience? Like, have you thought about getting or trying to work with brands outside of the CrossFit space? Like where, where have you put your energy with that? Yeah. So a lot of people think like I'm like diehard CrossFit and that's all I care about. So I only started off in the CrossFit space just because of the fact that I was a member at a CrossFit gym and that's how I kind of got my, my foot in the door. But CrossFit isn't the only thing I'm interested in. Like I love all types of sports. Um, so I actually have been actively trying to, um, you know, solicit and, and get involved with, uh, you know, other sports, especially the fact that the Olympics were something on my radar, but um, that all got taken away because of the pandemic. But, uh, but yeah, I've been trying to diversify just because I kind of feel like I kind of got pseudo typecast into like the CrossFit space. Um, and people think that's all I care about and that's all I do, which is not true. Um, but I've been actively trying to like pursue, um, and this is probably the only type of marketing self marketing I've been doing is actively trying to pursue other sports than CrossFit. So, um, not to say that I'm leaving CrossFit, but I, I do want to shoot more than CrossFit. I think, um, capturing any type of athletic movement in, in sport is probably like the, the goal for me, like, you know, I think I've, I've shot almost every type of athletic movement in CrossFit. So now it's time for me to just try something like, uh, for example, pole vaulting, right? So there's a lot of like cool little yeah. positions and shapes that the athlete can do. And 
yeah, I've been trying to do that in terms of uh, diversifying. How do you reach out to brands or reach out to companies or athletes that are in different spaces to work with them? Like, I know you've done yeah. some stuff with the track and field, um, but how do you how do you reach those other brands? Um, so surprisingly, like um, some of the stuff is referrals, and then some of the stuff is actually saying like, "Hey, I'm a rando stranger person, David." And uh, this is my work, and um, I happen to be traveling in your area. Um, are you interested in working together? And um, back to my previous comment before about like you know you gotta do some some work to get your uh, work out there pro bono. That's exactly what I've I've done. So there is like um, uh, Olympian athlete. Her name is uh, uh, Annika Newell. So she is a Canadian Olympian uh, pole vaulter, and I just said like, hey, I'm gonna be in texas would you like to uh you know work together and collaborate and content's 100 percent free and nothing beats free right so yeah <laughs> um she you know i didn't know if she was going to give me a time of day or respond back but luckily she did that might be a canadian thing because we're all nice but uh <laughs> she <laughs> she said yeah let's do it and we we linked up and then you know we hit it off we came uh we got along really well and i shot some of her content there's actually some footage uh, video footage I'm sitting on that I still need to edit. Um, and um, yeah, that would be another avenue to pursue. If you're willing to do some free work just for the fact that you want to grow and get get your feet wet in that type of space, um, whatever sport it may be, or it doesn't even have to be sport. It could be like, I don't know, maybe it's lifestyle photography because I've been kind of like messing around with that too as well because that's a little bit of a throwback to before I started doing training day and stuff. So um, if you identified a personality or someone you feel like would work well with you or has a good look hit them up and just see like if they're willing to grow with you and collaborate i think that's uh it's worth a shot right yeah i think the big thing that you you know you're saying is just reach out to people do a lot of pro bono work communicate well yeah i think that for a lot of young creatives or people getting into the space that's one of the best ways you can make contacts show what you can do and impress people with your work. Yeah. And I think, um, you, it's important to like approach work as a growing opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. cause I've definitely learned some things in terms of shooting styles or, or things that try out, um, in things like just like your, your local gym class coverage, you know, like yeah. I'm, I'm never going to say like, Hey, no, that's beneath me. I've, I've done this before and I've shot the CrossFit games and I shoot this athlete now and I don't do that stuff anymore. Like if that's something like you don't really want to do just because you don't have the time to do it or, or that's not your focus, that's fine. But I've never like, you know, told a local gym, like, yeah, I don't do that anymore because I'm, I'm I do this now and stuff. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of foolish and you're kind of burning bridges and, um, you know, my whole story has been about networking and referrals and stuff like that. So I really have to pay homage to the fact that, you know, I keep these relationships positive as much as possible. And that's benefited me in spades because people just keep talking and just saying like, Hey, I know this guy and it just happened to be me that they referred and I'm thankful for that. So, um, yeah, treat every opportunity as a growing, uh, growing exercise, maybe it'll be a negative one, maybe it'll be a good one. I don't know, but you'll never know unless you actually um, go through the process, right? Yeah, hundred percent. One, uh, one other thing. What's your what's your workflow like? I know people oh, always ask this question, <laughs> but what's what's the what's the photography workflow for for training day? Uh, so it really depends on which perspective you look at it. If it's something like an event, like the CrossFit games or, you know, like Dubai CrossFit championship, um, it is literally on the floor type of editing. You shoot the photo and you're in constant contact with whoever your social person is for that brand. And um, most likely they're watching a, a live feed or actually at the event and they'll literally be text messaging you saying like, I need this shot. So you're going to be like beaming it over to, from your from your camera to your phone, slapping on a, a pretty basic edit. Um, I'm not basic, but I mean like an edit that you can do on your phone that you're happy with. And then yeah. just literally like WhatsApping it back to them so they can post in real time. Because for, for event coverage, the workflow is, is more about immediacy versus like crazy quality, right? And you can do that crazy quality edit later on when you're back at your desktop, which I do later yeah. um, for my own personal feed. But I mean like 
that's the workflow for events. Not everyone's like that. Sometimes there's some clients that are more lax and they're willing to like let a couple hours go by so that when you get back to your desk or the media center or the booth to bang out that edit and send it over to them. But I found that 90% of the, the clients that do event coverage, they want that like in real time type of thing. Yeah. Um, in terms of workflow for like things that aren't really time pressed, it's, I, I, I uh, come back home, sift through the footage, you know, I need to think about it. Usually before, if I do a video project, I have it mapped out on my iPhone in terms of my, my shot list, in terms of the notes I have. Um, and I'll just sift through the coverage and then just like delete stuff I don't, I know I'm not going to use because, um, you know, as you know, video footage takes up a huge amount of space. Yeah. And, um, and then just like make quick notes about things that I want to keep and what I, what I don't want to keep. And, and then also make uh, little mental decisions about, do I need to reshoot this or not? Thankfully I haven't had to reshoot anything um, <laughs> lately, but, and that could happen, right? Could it, Cause maybe the athlete will have a bad day or maybe they're just not in a speaking mood in terms of like the narration that you need to um, extract from them. Or maybe the weather is horrible or, or maybe you messed up in terms of camera settings. Like all that's happened to me before. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know if that answered your question. In terms of like workflow, it's just, I try to work on it as, as fast as possible. Um, but uh, but I, have also, I have also sat on tons of content, which um, I just get too lazy to look at sometimes. <laughs> like, I think that's what happens when I struggle. Like, oh, what am I going to post on Instagram today? And, you know, in, I don't know. Yeah. I don't have a magic it's no like magic set formula. workflow or whatever so yeah. yeah how do you decide on what you post on instagram or like are you putting in the effort days and days in advance and playing okay this is monday's post this is tuesday's post or are you doing it like day before night before minutes before most of the time it's been like the night before which isn't good um <laughs> just because i have a full-time job in a regular life um but I think if there's one type of tidbit that I think does work in terms of hacking the algorithm is that you always want to try to capitalize on current events. So for example, mm -hmm. if it's like, I'm just going to make something up. Like, actually I did this for the, um, for star Wars fans, there was something called the, uh, uh, May, May the fourth, which is like May 4th star Wars day. And, yeah. It's star Wars day. So it's, it's May the fourth be with you, which is like a play on May the Force be with you. If you watch yeah. star Wars, so I knew in advance that that was coming up and I wanted to do something fun. And I've always wanted to like play around with like a lightsaber video effect, which is super easy to do. There's like so many tutorials online. And then I just like happened to work with Emma Lawson a lot around that time. And I said like, do you watch star Wars? She's like, Nope. And I'm like, okay, we're going to do this anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> and she is like, so super down for anything. She's like amazing. Like anything I propose, she's like, yeah, let's do it. So she was willing to like, you know, you know, experiment with me and i did that so that was something that i pre-planned for may the 4th on that yeah. time to post so that was an example of our uh, pre-planning uh most of the times i do it the night before um but if it's uh some type of event or some type of uh, time stamp thing like a rogue invitational then obviously try to like capitalize your post based upon the fact that everyone is paying attention to that type of event at that time like the games or rogue or water polluter because that's going to be your maximum window to um, grow your channel and content because people are going to be actively searching for that type of stuff. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I saw a huge growth during the games for my own channels, just from, yeah. you know, current events, athletes resharing. Some of it was just like the algorithm hit and it just yep. did really well. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do, I do believe there is a best time to post like, based upon your time zone and in the morning versus the late at evening or the afternoon, there are, there are best times to post because that's when people are cruising the app. Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of all gets thrown out the window. If you're like doing live coverage of an event where people are actively seeking out that content, because yeah. you want to be part of that, that pool of content that people are searching for when, when that actually happens. Right. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah with all the contacts and everything you have, how do you stay on top of networking and growing within the community? Cause like, you know, you guys don't know this, but David and I have a relationship outside of just this podcast. We've been friends for a while now and I hear 
your stories all the time. You're like, oh, I talked to this person, I got that person. Like, how do you like I don't even know how you stay in contact with all these people <laughs> and like keep up with them, but how do you how do you network within the community? Um, so I'll be hundred percent transparent. I'm horrible at that. Like <laughs> I actually have never made a conscious effort to like go out there and solicit business, which is oh, which is a bad thing in terms of growing. Um, I think I am the Forrest Gump of CrossFit photography, where I just happen <laughs> to be there at the at the right time, not even on purpose. Yeah. Um, I mean, like you said, we've had a friendship before this, and I and I want to say you were a pivotal part because. Um, one of the coaches at CrossFit Select was Tommy Markhauser, which is a uh, regionals level athlete over here in Toronto. He's at the games. He was at the games yeah, this year. He was at the games this year too. So good for Tommy. Um, but I met you through Tommy and Tommy invited me to, you know, hang out with you guys where you guys did this crazy, like all afternoon workout with Velner. Um, so I met you that day. I met Velner that day again, like right time, right place. Everyone kept in contact. I think even Scott, Scott Cornier was there too. Uh, no, Sam Cornier was there too. Um, yeah, he was yeah. there. Yeah, Sam Cornier Sam, was there. And I think Josh was there too. Josh Gervais. Right. Yeah, a lot of lot of heavy hitters. Right. And you you yourself were were regional athletes before. So I mean, like all like crazy heavy hitters. So right time, right place. Um, you know, shot the photos that day. Um, was learning that day too as well. Um, kept in contact with everyone. And I think in this space, it's just kind of like. I know a guy or I know this person because I've worked with them and I've had a great experience and I've been fortunate to be, to have been referred in, in that vein. Mm -hmm. And, um, it just kind of grew from there. And, uh, you know, of course, like if Pat needed something done for his sponsors, he would just basically say like, I know a guy, which would have been me or actually yourself at that time. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and it just kind of just grew from there. Like, yeah, I could literally tell you a story about, every brand and which connection and which degree of separation between an athlete and, and a referral um, that had taken place to get me where I, where, where I got. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, um, I, I feel like that's a thing that people struggle with in this space is cause now, you know, a lot of companies like have their guy. Yeah. You know, every, like all the com all the big companies have their guy and you know, how would you, what, what kind of, uh, advice would you give to a young creator who's trying to network and make it and and grow within this space these days i think they have to determine like what exactly is your end game what is your goal um is your goal to expose your work so people know about you and what you can do or is your goal to like maximize revenue and get paid for me because i had a full-time job like money wasn't really an issue because I had a, a normal job to like pay the bills. Mm -hmm. But um, I know for some people, it might be more of a kind of like hu a hustling type of thing where like, I got to like hustle, put my name out, network, blah, blah, blah. So I could like, you know, survive. Um, because I didn't have that pressure. I just kind of let the cards unfold as they may. And, um, and I think my biggest advice would be once you determine what exactly your end game is, whether or not it's like a survival mode type of job, versus exposing your your work out there, um, that'll determine your next step. So for me, it was more for exposing my work. So a lot of people don't realize this, but I did a lot of like pro bono stuff for like the first couple of years and I was happy to yeah. do it. It wasn't like a, oh man, I gotta do this job or thing for, for someone for free again. Like I was happy to do it because I could grow and I could expose my work. And um, I didn't really have any client p uh, pressure to like perform a certain way or deliver a certain type of like package or content for someone i just had to just do my own thing on my own schedule and um i think it worked out the best that way like i you know when, when people see you're motivated by um excellence and creativity versus like a dollar then mm -hmm. i think people kind of see that subconsciously and say like okay this guy really cares about his craft and is not trying to monetize it or grow his following on youtube or you know what i mean so yeah and people know that like it's kind of like if you have your own personal business you know who you're going to hire already within the first five minutes right 100 percent. yeah what would you say you know with all those connections what were you say, say some of your like favorite moments were or where, where did you like feel like something really landed within the space and you, you saw a lot of growth from it or you saw a lot of uh change for your own brand well, um hmm. 
It's a good question. I think Wadapalooza was a was a major event for me just for the fact that um you know Pat Pat had relied on me to provide content. You were there that year too. You were competing as an athlete. Yeah. Um, and I was happy to cover you guys in terms of your content too as well. Um, so that was a major thing. Um, I think the next milestone was was wit uh, wit fitness in the UK asking me to go with them to Dubai and um, and I went. I was gladly happy to go and yeah. When I went there, I met, uh, you know, I met Sarah Sigmund's daughter's manager. I didn't know who he was at that point, and I just treated him as, like a normal person. You know, he was very courteous, and and if he asked me some for some things like some content, like I didn't hesitate. I said, no, yeah, sure, I'm, I'll, I'll be happy to share some stuff. Didn't like try to put a dollar value on it. I just gave it to him and stuff, right? And that relationship uh, paid off because him and I uh, hit it off as as personal friends and. When it came next t- time to next year for Wadapalooza, he asked me to take care of all of Sarah Sigmund's daughter uh, content while she was in uh, Miami. So um, I did do that, and um, yeah, like I think I think my relationship with Wit and uh, in backland management with Snorri has grown a lot, and to the point where we we uh, casually just you know message each other on WhatsApp asking for advice or or what's the next step or how can we um, you know work together awesome yeah and those relationships are are, those relationships are really hard to come by most of the times brands events just want to use you and just not use you but just hire you because you know you're just basically the for lack of better words the hired help but when people actually like you know want to build a relationship with you in terms of you know even going as far as being personal friends i think those are probably the the best best relationships to have those are 100 percent the best relationships yeah and I mean, I've seen you interact with some of the the people and it's like, you're, you're not lying. Like these are like friendships. They're not just like business relationships. Yeah, I, I, I want to say it's probably a small group of, of athletes that I have a really good relationship with. And those are the ones yeah. that I always come back to. And those are the ones that, you know, if they ask me to do something like in a heartbeat, if I can, I'll jump on a plane and help them out. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's not a problem and it's it's reciprocal too, right? because these people aren't just like sucking me dry for content. Like they actually go out of their way to like, you know, um, try to like, um, help me too as well. Yeah. And you've, I mean, you've been so influential as well. And what I don't, I don't know if most people probably don't know this, but you've been super, super helpful in a lot of young creators and, and giving advice and helping them out. And, and you've, you know, you've really given your time to people like myself um, to help, help them grow. Yeah. And you know, you, you have a very selfless attitude towards a lot of the things you do. And I, I mean, I know it comes through and I, I hope people know that about you too, where it's not just, well, you're, a, you're like one of my good friends. So, I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, I don't know, I'm not trying to be a saint or being selfless or anything like that. It's just, I, I place a lot of emphasis on respect right so i mean like yeah like i can tell when someone's being very passive aggressive or you know like you know people like i meet a lot of people in the industry like in a similar field and i can i can tell if they're genuine or not you know and, yeah. or if they're just being cordial and and i want to say like out of the handful of people i've met like if i've ever sent a job over to you or referred you to someone else like it's because i actually believe in your work and i and i believe you deserve it right i'll never refer someone over um you know, if I've had a bad experience with them or if I, if I can tell that they're not genuine. Right. So, yeah, I mean, these are all great opportunities and, and, um, and, uh, you know, like, like for the small handful of people that I've done this for, like, I feel like they are just starting their journey and like for yourself, yourself, uh, as an example, like you're just starting your journey. Like, this is just the beginning. Like, I know a lot of things are moving at a very fast pace for you, but yeah. <laughs> this is just the beginning. Like you're going to, your, your growth is just going to like, you know, you're just starting off. So, so I'm very excited for those things. And if I can somehow find an opportunity for you guys, for the small batch of people that I've, that I've, uh, that I always go to and talk to and help out and stuff like, yeah, I'm all for it. Like I'm not trying to steal everyone's job or anything like that, or try to like get all the gigs. Like I'm, <laughs> that's not even like my MO. Like I feel like there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of growth. Um, but yeah, um, it's definitely reciprocated because, you know, like if I believe in you, then yeah, you'll probably get a message from me saying like, Hey, like so-and-so needs this. You're the guy. 
go yeah. Up. yeah. I've been there and I, I definitely appreciate that a lot. <laughs> yeah. I've been a recipient of, of some of these jobs and things that you, you <laughs> you're talking about. And I, I'm definitely appreciative of it. Um, I know there's a lot of people, I know a couple other people as well that are also very appreciative and, you know, when you, when you came into, I would say, sorry, let me come back. When you came into the sport and into the space, you, you brought a very unique style that I think a lot of people have gravitated towards. And you, I feel like you changed the game for creatives in the space. I don't think there was the creativity from outside influences before. I think it was just like, here's a picture, here's a workout, boom, here's this, you know, and you brought this creative spin. You brought a unique editing style. It's not just straight out of camera. What would you say for creators now trying to find their voice and their, 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 yeah, let's say their voice within the sport or within photography or media in general, how would you tell them to like go out and find their, their look or their their voice um it's a good question i think i would i would tell them just look from within like what are your interests what are you influenced by mm -hmm. whether it's like i don't know jazz i'm just making this stuff up like if it's <laughs> jazz music or i don't know like hello kitty i don't know if if that's what you like and yeah. that's what you're proud of like you know pushing out as your type of like look then you know use that use that and that's that's kind of like everything I do is reflective of my style, like, which is pretty much just grayscale, like white, gray, and black. Right. So yeah. those are like the tones and the colors that I like to emphasize in the beginning. I started off like really moody and really dark. And mm -hmm. I did, I did quickly pivot after like the first year or so. Um, but I mean like, and, and that's fine too. Like you can change, like people evolve and they grow and your style changes, which is fine. But if you're trying to find your unique like position in this space or, your unique look or what you're known for like the best thing to do is just think about what you value and what you like whether it's cars motorcycles music whatever right and then see if there's some type of bit that you can take from that personal aspect of who you are and reflect it in terms of your content then then i think that's how you become original if you're trying to like just say like hey i like i like justin's photo how can i be more like justin's photo then all you're trying to do is just be like justin right which is fine because you could be influenced by Justin, but it's better to have your own um, flip on it. You know what I mean? Because I've had some people, even yourself, send me over a photo going, hey, is this your photo? And I'm looking at it like, that actually looks like something I would do, but it's actually not my photo, right? Yeah. So that, that that's where the, the problem lies herein. Like, I mean, like, I don't know if that was intentional, whoever did that. And, and if it is, that's fine. Like, but I think if you are trying to answer for yourself, like, you know, you want to try to find your own style and what you're known for, like, just look from within and what you're influenced by and what you, what you value, what you like, and see if there's a way to just kind of like paint your content with that type of, that type of influence. Right. Um, like maybe in one year I'll change again because maybe I'll no longer be interested in the things that I just listed off. Right. And, and that's fine too. Maybe you'll no longer be interested in Hello Kitty. Yeah, maybe I'll <laughs> maybe I'll stop wasting all my money on Hello Kitty collectibles and you know empty out that dedicated Hello Kitty collectibles ring. So <laughs> I hope people know we're joking. <laughs> this isn't something I and know. If about I'm not joking, Dave. it's fine too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right, for for the people you know the the gearheads out there that might be listening, what what are you shooting with? What do you use regularly? What's what's your like? Uh, what's your go to? Okay, so my kit, uh, surprisingly, is not a very professional kit, like compared to like people using like Canon R3s and all that other stuff like that. It's actually a Sony a7 III, which is considered like um, the basic model for Sony, but it's far from basic. Like it's just phenomenal camera. Like I've talked to you about this offline before. Yeah. It's just a great camera. It's like it, it can shoot 10 frames per second, which I think is like, you know, just perfect, um, especially if you're just starting off in this format. Um, great battery life. Um, they have changed the models to better models, but nothing has replaced the A7 III officially yet. Nothing. So um, that's a Sony product, by the way. So I'm a purely Sony guy. 
Um, in terms of lenses, like the go-to for events, or even mostly everything usually has been my 70 to 200, just because it's just got a lot of reach. Um, mm -hmm. Also, it's a G Master, it's a 2.8. Um, it's a great, it's a great lens. You, you've got that lens too as well. Yeah. Um, and you can, you can accomplish a lot with it too. Um, but I'm, I used to be, and I still am mostly a primes guy. So I like to, um, you know, shoot a lot with primes and, um, usually these things that are like low aperture, super wide, not super wide, but somewhere in the range of 24 to 20. Um, that's kind of like my sweet spot. And, um, surprisingly, I only have one body. Like I don't, I'm, I'm not like a lot of people where when I went to the games, everyone has two bodies or dual bodies. Like, yeah, something I'm thinking about, but I just, I, I guess I haven't done that yet. And I'm just so used to like the street photography thing where you just have a backpack and you just constantly just changing your lenses on the fly. And yeah, like, I'm okay with that. A lot of people think like, that's just too much work, but I'm just like, oh man, I remember going to the games in 2019 and all these people giving me like the weirdest looks like, this guy's literally swapping out a lens on the sidelines yeah. while, <laughs> while all the shit's going down on the field. And I'm just like, yeah, I yeah. am like, that's fine. I still got it. Still got the shot. Right. Got the shot. That's all yeah. that matters. Yeah. Uh, right on. And then where can everybody find you online? Um, so I'm on Instagram under training day media, all one word. Um, I think I have a Facebook account. I don't really use it. I think it's the same thing too as well. But if you go to the Instagram account, there should be like links, I think in the bio or something like that. And that goes to my YouTube page, which I'm trying to grow. Um, so I want to do some tutorials and content there as well. It's just a matter of time. And uh, video editing takes up a lot of time. Like, <laughs> it takes up a lot of time. I don't think I have to explain it to you or anyone else that does it right now. Um, unless you're like a fucking phenomenal, am I allowed to swear here? It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Unless you're an amazing like video person um, that can edit really fast. Like actually I did meet someone recently. Um, shout out to BC Visions. He's like, you know, an amazing video editor. That dude um, turns out some nice stuff. Yeah, and he's fast. He's fast. And um, he's he's underrated. Like not a lot of people know him in the CrossFit space, but he actually does a lot of like um, heavy hitter uh, blogs for other people um of uh, vlogs vlogs not blogs um but yeah he's he's amazing and we actually had a little bit of a a rant about uh appropriate access for people and us not being able to like get the shots that we need at, at some type of um at some events and stuff but he still manages to work with what he has and just kills it so but yeah you can find me on instagram under training day media and on youtube and um and barely on TikTok, but I'm there too as well. <laughs> barely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Dave, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. And yeah, no uh, problem. we'll talk soon. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Hit that like button and subscribe down below for more content coming soon from Wadproof.